I'd like to welcome everybody who's either joining us live or who will join us later. My name is Steve Fidel. I'm the director of the Daily Universe, which is the student news lab at Brigham Young University School of Communications. Um, I first met Professor E.R. Ship, who is our special guest today, when she was a guest on the BYU campus a couple of years ago. Uh, and um, even as recently as yesterday, she was teaching me uh, about better ways to frame questions about <laughs> racism and civil rights. So my instruction continues. Um, Professor Ship is one of the founding faculty members of the uh, School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University in, in Baltimore. Uh, as a journalist, she has been on the staffs of the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the Washington Post, uh, before that was uh, earned a law degree at Columbia and also master's degrees in journalism and history also at Columbia. She is also the first black woman to be awarded the Pulitzer Prize for commentary and her commentary on the world we live in today um, because of George Floyd and what has happened since then is, is what creates our training opportunity today. So let, let's just dive right in and Professor Ship, how are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you for asking. I'm going to start with a disclaimer. What I say today is based on my experience, my observations, my research, and my reporting. I do not in any way speak for all Black Americans. I don't even know if I represent all Black Americans. But having said that, good morning. And as to how I feel, I actually jotted some things down so I would cover the basis, so bear with me. Uh, in this, I know I'm reflective of a number of Black people. I feel anger that yet another Black person has had a life snuffed out by someone white wielding power bestowed upon them by our society. I'm feeling frustration after all these years of struggle, after all this work to do what is expected of an American citizen to be talking about all of this, uh, talking about how to fix this, and still we've gotten no further than where we are. There's a sense of incredulity that people who are not Black, especially white people, are just now recognizing the burden which Black people have lived under for so many years. There's a sense of exhaustion from the energy it takes to navigate. Things like, is it safe for a black person to be here? Or do I look suspicious? Uh, am I gonna be threatening to somebody? And it's exhausting to try to explain black people to people who are not black. Um, and I feel like I've been running this race since I was forced by my parents to help integrate my school, the high school in my hometown back in 1968. So a few months after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and when I was still trying to process that, I was thrown into this white Rockdale High School. Um, the proverbial Everybody and his mother tried to prepare me for that experience by telling me how to behave properly around white people. So that was an interesting summer. You were supposed to be deferential. You were supposed to be non-confrontational, supposed to be nice, had to be very neat, had to be very clean, all of that. Uh, I've been wondering and questioning, so that's part of this whole feeling, if, as Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something to change, a different result, then are Black people collectively crazy to think that we can ever achieve this American dream of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? But ultimately, I'm feeling available. Uh, even though I'm disappointed and hurt that so many people who are not Black are still so ignorant and oblivious, I stretch my hands out uh, one more time again, they say in church, <laughs> to anybody who sincerely wants to learn to self-correct and to make a difference. So that's how I feel. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for being available. 
uh, in light of all of the other things that you talked about. So you, you talked about um, being a little, perhaps being a little crazy because we keep trying to do the same things, but in, in, in today's situation, because of what happened to George Floyd, what about this incident has, um, I mean, what are the key civil rights issues here? Well, the whole notion of the right to life, <laughs> the right to liberty, the right to pursuit of happiness, all of that, you can see in what happened in Minneapolis that the response of the police negated his humanity and was out of proportion entirely to whatever the offense was that supposedly occurred. We don't even know if George Floyd knew that the $20 bill he gave the clerk in the store was counterfeit. We are all susceptible to picking up a bill here and there that is not a real thing. Um, but even if it were, and even if he did deliberately pass that bill along, uh, the response of the police, a team of police officers, and then the way he was tackled and thrown to the ground, and then ultimately what happened after that, was very much a denial of his humanity, a denial of not just what we call civil rights, but his human rights. So that's the frame in which we look at all of this. Okay, so what is it about this incident? Because uh, unfortunately there are way too many. Mm -hmm. What it is about this incident that, in, that ignited a global firestorm that we're seeing around the world? Well, a lot of people put it as to, in terms of uh, why is this different from the others and is this the one that's going to lead us somewhere? And the answer is we won't know that until we see what the outcome is from this outpouring of outrage, right? Um, we keep hearing things like this is an inflection point. It's a tipping point. It's a transformational moment. Those are nice words that we can use in headlines or whatever, but we won't really know that for a little while. We've been on this road for a long, long time. We've seen other unarmed black men and black women who are not resisting the police and not posing any threats, but are yet killed. So, uh, we don't know if this is just another stop along the way or whether it's going to go somewhere. What we do know that feels a little bit different are some of these things. Um, it may be the timing of all of this. We're in the middle of a pandemic and you have a captive audience. Since we're not going anywhere, we have a lot more time to spend with whether it's television or online sources, we know what's going on. Um, and then related to that may be the fact that we've got all this pent up energy from three months or so of being in lockdown and you need to express something. So that may have something to do with uh, the outpouring of people. But again, with timing is when you think about it, in a matter of weeks, we had uh, Ahmad Arbery in my home state of Georgia being lynched there in uh, Brunswick, Georgia. We're still trying to process that, how these two, two or three men uh, thought it was okay for them to pursue someone they thought might have been uh, up to no good when he, his family says, he was just jogging. Um, we had that and then we had um, Breonna Taylor in Kentucky. In her own home, uh, cops who I understand were not in uniform, so it's just some strange people bursting through the door um, her companion shoots at these intruders and they then shoot, the police shoot, and they kill her. Um, so you're still processing that. Then you get this crazy incident at Central Park where this white woman walking her dog is, um, decides that the way to resolve a conflict with a, a bird watcher who happens to be a black man uh, was to get on the phone, to tell him she was going to get on the phone and call the police to tell them she's being threatened by a black man. Knowing that all of those words will be triggers to get the police to come with a particular kind of response. And then we get eight minutes and 46 seconds, I guess it is, of what happened in the last moments of George Floyd's life. 
So we've seen stuff on film before, but all this coming together and then seeing those minutes with him saying he can't breathe and then in the course of his last breath, calling for his mother, who was dead, had been dead for a few years. All of that had some impact on people emotionally. Um, the length of the video has something to do with it too. We've seen snippets of things going on before, but this was long, long enough to see this man who started out upright, six foot four or six, I've heard both figures, um, big man had worked in security. Uh, and you see this man brought down to this person who's whimpering and calling for his mother. That had something to do with it. There had been some latent activism going on because of uh, 2020 elections and also census. So there are people out there who are, you know, uh, organizing anyway. So it became a little easier to organize around this. Um, the media commitment to the story seems a little different now. And we're seeing that having people of color in some of these spots, particularly on television, I'm seeing, uh, leads to some stories that are a little bit more deep and a little bit more sensitive. So that's a little different now. I think we see the cumulative effect of having been down this road before, journalists kind of know what the issues are. At least they know a little better. They're not perfect yet. And then we have the man that we have in the White House who's not making anything better. And that is adding to people's desire to speak up and speak out about what's going on. It's probably as much about George Floyd, as it is also about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. And um, the global response seems to be much different, in part because of all the media uh, options we have now. But probably also, it's, it's a response to, again, this current president's being seemingly xenophobic, anti-immigrant, all of these things. Uh, withdrawing from international agreements. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of grievances against him around the world. So that plus the horror of what happened to George Floyd probably has added to the international um, outpouring of support. It also gives cover to those in various countries to also raise issues about what's happening in their own countries. So a lot of things are going on there. So for all of those reasons, this feels a little different, but whether it ends up being different remains to be seen. Do you feel day to day like Americans feel that racial issues are an American issue and not a global issue and that this is somehow an awakening to see that there are riots in Paris and London and elsewhere? Well, the same people who are surprised that this kind of um, that these kind of disparities exist when it comes to law enforcement or when it comes to health care, we've seen with COVID-19. The same people who are surprised that that would be surprised perhaps about the international outpouring. But if you are aware at all, you know that there has been a long tradition of people abroad um, identifying with the black civil rights movement in this country. And in fact, you, you'll notice in a lot of places that they've adopted uh, We Shall Overcome as their anthem. Mm -hmm. uh, in some places more recently, Black Lives Matter is a, is a, a slogan that's uh, traveled across the pond. So there has been this identity with uh, Black folk and the civil rights struggle uh, for years. Thank you. Uh, now that we've been able to talk a little bit uh, for those who have just joined us or recently joined us. If you have a question for Professor Ship, please put it in the Zoom chat. And uh, we're going to go about an hour, but we'll see how many things that we can cover in the time we have there. So put your questions in the chat and I'll do my best to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you were, you're hitting on some of the international issues. It's now been 17 days since George Floyd was killed. Mm -hmm. What are the things? that you've seen that have been helpful since then and what's happening that is not helpful in, in, in as you take a 50,000 foot look at the situation? Mm. Um, let me think what's been helpful first. What's been helpful, I think, um, 
have been the cameras and the internet. Um, we know the picture paints is worth a thousand words uh, line. Then video, why distributed over the internet is multiple times more valuable. Um, what we've been saying, we black people have been saying for decades about what's been going on in uh, our country when it comes not just to law enforcement, but when it comes to other issues. Um, we've been saying it to ourselves, I guess, and we've been saying it in our black media outlets. And sometimes our elected officials say it on the floors of Congress or what have you, but it's as if unless you have video or some way that people can have something to touch, then it becomes valid. Uh, so having these cameras and the internet have been useful in proving to the rest of America and to the rest of the world that what we're saying is not um, a hallucination and we're not just being whiners, that there's something real going on that needs to be addressed. I think, um, as I alluded to before, I think COVID-19 has been helpful to us because it has given people more time to think about other things than their everyday rushing around. Now they can focus on um, um, things in ways they hadn't before. They have more time with their family. They have more time to watch TV. I've watched so many documentaries in the last months or so. You have a time to, to learn things, to read books, to take to read, catch up with the magazines that are piling up. So with all of that, uh, COVID-19 has forced us to be inward a little bit more. And so we've had some time to think about things. What's been very helpful is white people showing up in the numbers they are. And while we've seen various coalitions over the years, we haven't seen it as broadly varied as it feels like we're seeing now on the streets. We're seeing uh, people of all races, ethnicities joining the force. But when we see white people out there, there's something significant about that in that um, when white people decide something is worthwhile and worth pursuing as is important, should be a priority, they tend to be heard quicker than some of the rest of us. So having white people show up is important for that. It also can be, I noticed uh, in um, a news clip the other day, uh, when it comes to the confrontations that sometimes occur between the police in riot gear and the civilians on the other side, I've seen white people going to the front of the line and locking hands to try to protect those uh, protesters behind them. That's all important stuff too. Uh, what's been helpful, it seems, is money that people are now pouring in. Um, I see that various people, corporations in particular, are giving money to the NAACP, to the Urban League, to various Black Lives Matter type organizations. More importantly, I think, to organizations uh, providing food, uh, education, healthcare, and recreation for young people. Money seems to be more available from private donors in particular. Um, there's an availability of resources for people who want to learn more about race, about black people, about American history. A number of resources are out there that are free for a while. And I mentioned some to you yesterday. But there are um, compilations. I noticed in, I have um, uh, Comcast Xfinity, and they have a whole section now you can go to in the on demand that are curated materials related to Black people, race, history, et cetera. Um, and I'm sure other cable systems must be doing something similar. And then um, Netflix and others are providing free streaming of some of their movies, whether it's Selma or I'm Not Your Negro or whatever. Uh, just Mercy, the, the movie that just came out um, last year is also available free. And then there are book lists and reading lists uh, popping up everywhere. So resources are helpful. Um, I think the intense media scrutiny is helpful, though I'm annoyed at some of that. So that also comes into my unhelpful list. The, un, um, the media scrutiny 
allows a lot of, I'm talking mostly now the television stuff that I'm seeing, allows a lot of the anchors in that little chit chat they feel they have to do all the time between the stories. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of that is like, oh, really? They're saying silly things. And they're always trying to find the silver lining, the feel good story. Isn't that nice? That little girl kissed that little cop or, you know, whatever. I mean, they, they try to do those things and that becomes unhelpful, I think, to make people stay focused on the seriousness of what's going on. And then for a while, it seems uh, they were conflating protesting with rioting and rioting and looting. And in many cases, different people were involved in those various activities and they were all being broadcast to us as if it was all these people doing the same thing. They did one thing in the daylight and one thing at night. And, and that was not, uh, is not very accurate. There's still this hunt for a spokesperson, for a leader, you know, and so, and that becomes unhelpful and annoying. Uh, because I think rather than seeing this as uh, um, unorganized and chaotic, uh, they're missing the point that there's some strategy behind that. I think younger folk in particular learned from the civil rights movements of the 60s that if you have one person as the leader, that one person becomes a giant target. And if you can eliminate that person, you can really destroy or at least largely curtail the effectiveness of the movement. So if the leadership is spread all over the place, then you have a better chance of uh, uh, succeeding over the long haul. It can be difficult if you're the reporter looking for someone to quote, but in terms of the movements themselves, it probably makes a lot of sense. And then I've seen uh, some mischaracterizations of things that are uh, probably um, related to the fact that some of the people doing the reporting are young, so they're repeating things that they did not live through, and so they don't realize when they say it that they're wrong. Uh, or it's, um, oh, I don't know, it just may be a generational thing generally, but I noticed, for example, some, somebody said the other day, and I heard it repeated two or three times, variations on Atlanta is the um, birthplace of the civil rights movement. And that is not true. <laughs> Atlanta was where Martin Luther King Jr. was born, but that is not the birthplace of the civil rights movement. So you'll hear things like that. And then you'll hear characterizations of what the Selma movement was about, or even what the March on Washington was about. And I've, I've gotten to a point of understanding that I'm now uh, old enough to have lived through or studied enough of this that I'm going to notice all the mistakes and I can't get hung up on the mistakes because I'll go crazy. The question is whether they are distorting the story enough that they are uh, uh, harming, uh, doing more harm than good. And if, if that's the case, then I should speak up. But never, nothing is ever going to be uh, perfect that way. Um, the um, people continuing to tell us that this is a great inflection point, uh, tripping point, uh, you know, all of that stuff, that's not very helpful. Um, you're trying to characterize something and put a spin on it before it's played itself out for us to know exactly what it is that we're going through right now. It's something major, but we don't know what it is yet. Um, some people, particularly people who are not Black, doing more talking than listening is unhelpful. You need to listen. Don't think you have all the answers. No one has answers. Not, black people don't even have the answers, but but don't pretend that you know the answer because you remember covering something in Vietnam or you went somewhere or whatever. I'm, you don't have the answer, so just shut up. Um, what's not helpful from, a, from the personal um, health and emotional well-being of individual Black people is having their white friends turn to them for comfort because the white friend is feeling out of sorts and guilty and sad and whatever, and they want the black person to be their caregiver. And we got to deal with this ourselves. We don't have time for you in that regard. So that's not very helpful. Um, turning Black Lives Matter into the slogan of the day is not very helpful because it's not a trending hashtag. And so I get worried when I hear everybody from Mitt Romney to McDonald's um, 
using Black Lives Matter when I'm not sure they know what they're saying when they say those words. It's not just a slogan. There's a lot behind that. It means that if you truly believe Black Lives Matter, you've got to do some stuff. You've got to change a lot of things that are going on in our society. You've got to spend some money on some social justice programs. You've got to do something besides say Black Lives Matter. Uh, and that's just a little bit, I guess, of what I would say. Oh, another thing that's not helpful, and this may partly be a generational thing too, it's not helpful to use provocative slogans. And this is on the part of the activists now. Defund the police is not very helpful. Now, in my younger days, I probably would have been screaming defund the police. But as a more mature person who knows the backlash that will come from spinning that defund the police um, is, is not worth it. Give me a second here. I don't know what that one is. Um, <laughs> I'm expecting a delivery of groceries today. So <laughs> and I, they, it was supposed to be tomorrow, but they called and said they may be coming this morning. So we'll see. Um, in any case, um, defund the police really is about removing some of the responsibilities that we're now saddling police with and moving them to agencies where it makes more sense. So social workers should be involved, healthcare people should be involved. And if you're taking away some of those responsibilities and services, then the police department doesn't need the same budget that it has now. You're, you're shifting the resources. That's what I think some people mean by defund the police. But the enemy does not take that. Excuse me, let me see if this is my groceries. Hello? Hello? We do have a couple of questions coming yeah, in on the chat. Some of them are long enough and then small enough type that I'm having a hard time reading them. So if you summarize a question and send it to me short, I can read it. Okay, better. I'm going to take a brief break to go and let this person in. So you guys get your questions together and I'll be right back. Okay. All right. And we come up to next. I'm here. Good, you're back. <laughs> but you have food and you can uh, eat and live for another week until we get to do this again. It's all, you know, it's really all about me. It's very selfish motive. Of course. <laughs> um, we did want to uh, talk also, uh, since we are, our audience today are either people teaching journalism or the emerging journalists who are being taught about uh, the role of journalism is playing in this and the fact that journalists are not exactly the good guys in, in uh, especially in the view of some law enforcement, but let's go down that road uh, a little bit, if you would, and just talk about uh, the impact of journalism, but also for the for this audience, the, the takeaways they should have as they are perhaps covering their first protest or involved for the first time in a very active civil rights kind of a movement. Well, um, it's always difficult when you're thrown into one of these uh, situations. Uh, but as much as you can, study a little bit. And so you may have to find uh, some way to get the equivalent of a, a cheat sheet to have some basic information about who the players are and what the issues are. And don't assume that the issue started yesterday. Uh, there's generally a history there. So it behooves the, the journalists to educate themselves. And it really is important not to be seen uh, first, I guess, or primarily with the police as your escort somehow. Sometimes reporters in these situations go to a zone that's been designated for the press. And it's as if they have some special protection um, that's separating them from the protesters. You kind of don't want to be seen to be on the side of anybody, but you definitely don't want to be uh, identified as somehow the police are giving you some kind of special protection. Now, often we've seen that many police 
are not giving any protection at all, but sometimes they do still have these areas set aside for the press. Um, don't assume that every black person you find in one of these situations knows what he or she is talking about. And sometimes I think we do that. We're so grateful that we found someone who will talk to us that we don't make a critical judgment of, does this person know what they're talking about? Um, is this person really representative of the folks who are out here today? Uh, does this person really even have a connection or is this just someone who flew in like you did probably in the press, who flew in to take part in this? So we have to be a little careful. Um, I, I know when you're just getting started and you go to one of these things, you're really excited, you're still idealistic. We're all idealistic when we start this. And some of us maintain some of that. Uh, but I don't wanna curb your enthusiasm, but you need to, um, well, let me pause on that one. It's important for every generation to take up the fight. So I understand that. Coretta Scott King said, and I'll read her quote, freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. That is what we have not taught young people or older ones for that matter. You do not finally win a state of freedom that is protected forever. So the struggle continues. The struggle is ongoing. And every generation, whether it's the activists or the young journalists, will have to find themselves defining how they are participating in that thing that's going on right now. And so some of the rules that we used as journalists may not really be applicable now. And I think that's part of this conflict that was uh, described in one of the articles that I asked people to read. So some of the rules don't necessarily apply, uh, but you should be mindful of what the rules have been, at least, as everybody is trying to figure out how we're how this struggle is going on and what the role of the journalist is and what the role of the protesters are. When you're uh, assigned to these kinds of stories, beware of the PR campaigns in all kinds of forms. But one that's particularly annoying to me is this repetition of the notion that we're all in this together. And we really are not all in this together. And in fact, I say that that's the okie doke. That's the, that's the, you know, that someone's conning you into thinking that. But the real good journalists will realize that it's where we're not all in this together that makes for the best stories. So just like, uh, <laughs> just like I was interrupted because I'm getting a delivery of groceries through Instacart, I've sat down and on my computer went through all the various food products I wanted and I made some choices between kinds of cold brew coffee. Um, there are people in line to get boxes of food out there. So we are not in this in, in the same way. So we need to not get blindsided by that whole notion of this. We need to look for those ways that people are suffering. And since many of the people doing the reporting and thus characterizing what's going on out there are comfortably middle class, they may be missing out on what's really happening out there. So I would say if you are doing reporting about this time, be careful not to swallow uh, the Kool-Aid about we're all in this together. Um, the um, well, I was going to give some more examples of the ways I know we're not in this together. People, a lot of people are still waiting for the stimulus checks. A lot of people who applied for and qualified for unemployment uh, months ago now have not received their money. So what does that mean? Uh, when the school systems went to remote teaching and learning, what about those poor families that didn't have computers, didn't have Wi-Fi, and didn't have people in the household who could even guide the students through the materials they're supposed to go through? What about the students who were from homeless families? 
where, what are they going to be doing during all this time when it comes to this learning? So stories need to be focusing on those things that are not obvious, but it's something that we ought to be taking a look at as reporters who are trying to really understand what's going on. Um, I think those are some of the main points of advice I would give to students. Well, here's another one though. I guess, let me see if I can articulate this. Um, when you're just starting out, everything is new because you haven't known it before. You're just learning it for the first time. That doesn't mean it's new to everybody else. So don't be, um, and Steve, you used the term Christopher Columbus the other day. So I'm going to bring this up. Don't be Christopher Columbus. Don't think that you just discovered something because <laughs> the stuff has been going on probably for a while. So don't, so you can be eager and bring a fresh eye, but don't think you have just unearthed something. It's offensive to those who've been doing the work and, and suffering through the experiences for a long time. Um, and, and keep in mind that this issue has become more global than some other uh, issues have in the past. So look to see what the global uh, reflection of this is. And that may help inform how you are uh, coming up with stories for what you're focusing on domestically. Um, know something about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and be aware of press freedom and how that's being affected by COVID-19, not only abroad, but they may help you to look for how it's being affected in our country. So there are lots of things you can be doing uh, during this time as you're going out to do good journalism. And uh, with that, I guess I'll end with some advice. And if people have specific questions, I might have something else to say. All right. Um, I want to go back to one thing you talked about a minute ago that plays into this. Um, I'll preface it with my experience with protests. Uh, is It covers a lot of time, but nothing of this scale. Uh, I'll go to that first. But one of the things that I became wary of as a journalist at a protest was the person who approached me and wanted to talk to me because they were usually part of that PR campaign you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, how is the best way to find somebody who's not just the great soundbite in the cacophony of a protest? Well, it depends on when, how, you, how you are approaching this thing. Did you show up when people are already in the street and you just came to the street part of this? Or did you get there beforehand so you could get the lay of the land and figure out who the leaders are, who's leading the march, and sort of zero in on that? That could be helpful. But if you get there and have some time to spend beyond the, your first your introduction to what's happening in the street, then you need to go and look to who the, um, the traditional leaders have been and who some of the emerging younger leaders are. And there are people who can be helpful with that. Your, if you're going to a place you've not been before, then the local media people tend to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be helpful to younger people and out of town people. So that- you know the players, is that? Yeah, so okay. that could be helpful to you. But then you could look for something um, like uh, the leader of some ministerial alliance kind of person, uh, someone who's working with young people. So someone who's working with you could start with the YMCA kind of thing, but some kind of youth program to get you started. And then find out who the Black Lives Matter people are, where you are. That's just going to get you started. And then you got ask people to tell you about other people you should be talking to. And you're constantly building your source list. You also, when you have the time, should go and look at what's been already been reported on this situation, because you'll come up with sources through who's already been cited in local media or regional media. So uh, you're not reinventing a wheel. You're coming into this, but you should do it sensibly. Um, and as I said, you are gonna have to talk to the police people, of course. I'm not saying you're not gonna do that, but you don't want them to be your sole source or your main source because they have a particular way of viewing that is not the same as those who are doing the protesting. So be aware of that. And be aware that there's a, in this uh, particular movement, if we wanna call it that, uh, there's some rivalry that is apparent to me and may not be as apparent to some others, but there is some rivalry um, 
where black activists are not so sure they want to invite the quote unquote white activist groups to come in uh, in a leadership role. They are saying this should be led by black lives because it's about black lives. So don't get caught up in the friction stuff. Um, in, uh, I guess it's the same as I said before, you wanna make sure you're not being identified with a particular side. And that takes some delicate dancing because you do want to find out what everybody has to say, but you want to always be the reporter who is not a participant. All right. Now you made a good argument a bit ago uh, for having a central a voice for a movement. And then you made an equally good argument for not having one because they become the target, um, which was the case with both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. So, do you want, uh, do you have a preference as to whether there becomes a, a more centralized voice for this, if we want to call it a movement or how do you, where do you want to go with that? I don't. And I think it's not even for me to even say now, um, because I think my time of being in the streets in the activist role and even in the streets as a journalist almost is I, I'm not there now. I'm the, I'm the wise elder observing and providing. <laughs> <laughs> counsel. But when it comes to this leadership, I had a, a, a black journalist slash minister of the gospel because he does both. The other day we were talking, he said, I wish they'd all get together so we just have uh, one message and uh, we'll know what it is they want. And I said, why should they? Because there are a lot of issues out there and there are different people with different agendas. We've got to allow for that. There is no one way to be black. There is no one answer for being black. So there are different people, even with things like the approach to the police. Some people do indeed want to get rid of police departments. Some people want to do some kind of reform. Some people are somewhere in between because they think reform just, you know, chomping away at the edges is really not going to address the problems. So they realize it's a more complicated thing. But there are people from all over the place with that. Who am I to say that we have to pick one of them to be the leader? Uh, let, put the ideas out there. And we have this free marketplace of ideas. Put the ideas out there and we, people collectively, will figure out what works, what makes sense, what we can use to find common ground with. It won't be defund the police, but it'll be something when you put it in the terms of, well, let's reassign the resources. And if you do that, you don't have to spend as much money on police services. Then you might find ways to get people to come to some agreement. So I'm not gonna take, uh, uh, make a, a choice between a single leader versus. When you think about it, Black Lives Matter started as a coalition of three people who organized this thing. And they also had in mind at the time that you didn't want uh, a Black Lives Matter Incorporated. Every uh, jurisdiction that has Black Lives Matter movements is on its own. They convene via, you know, you organize via cell phone, text messages, say, let's do whatever we need to do, whatever. That's frustrating to older people who are used to the organization, the committees, the commissions, the, all of the, 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 um, the working groups, uh, and, and that's not working for the younger generation of activists. It's too slow, too cumbersome, and too male-oriented. This way, if you're spreading the leadership around, you have a better chance of having a variety of voices and experiences. And it's not all going to be middle-class values uh, if you're doing it this way. So I say more power to all of them, and we will sort it all out over time. We have some good questions that have come in. If I, let me see if I can summarize something and if I got it wrong, you can correct me. But one of the themes of what I hear you saying for reporters is that they have to be prepared for an event that they go to before they get there. You can't just show up and expect to be able to dissect it, synthesize it, understand what's going on, understand the dynamics. So the, the research, the background, the not being Christopher Columbus as we were bantering about, is a very important part of being prepared for any kind of news coverage. Mm -hmm. Did I do that definitely okay? So. De yes, definitely so. Okay. Um, and it's particularly so if you are 
white going into a predominantly black and brown place. You need to, you need to know what you're going into. I had to do that when I was going into a predominantly white space. Mm-hmm. And that was a lot of them. <laughs> so you have to do the homework. Um, and it's not because you're white per se, it's because you don't have the experience that these people are talking about or living through right now. So I had to spend a lot of time learning about um, oh, the right to life movement. And there was a big convention in Chicago uh, when I was out there as a correspondent for the Times. And I had to learn about what they meant by adopting Thurgood and Marshall's strategy in the civil rights era. They were gonna adopt some of his strategy for um, uh, getting an overturn of Roe versus Wade. I think it was what it came down to. So I had to do a lot of work, spend a lot of time. So when I got to their conferences, I, could, I knew exactly what they were talking about. I could ask some questions in an informed way. I could recite to them some of the things they were relying upon. And it was a more interesting conversation and a better story that way. So I think everybody has to do that. Some people though think that just because they have covered something big before and they've made a name for themselves for something that they can automatically cover this the same way. And that's where I think we make the mistakes. All right, Um, two questions from our students. Now, the, uh, we're predominantly a, a, a white community covering protests that have uh, members that bring out the black members of the community, but they're still a, a remark, a distinct minority. What is the, what are some of the th- key things that need to be unique, perhaps, about our uh, coverage or walking into these situations in an area where we just don't have enough of a black community for that to have a frame of reference in day in, in day to day life, short of a conflict. So when you're in the conflict period, it's kind of hard to get to know the community. So somebody should be getting to know the community before then. And typically for for black communities, and I guess this may be true for all so-called minority communities, a starting point becomes the faith community only because that's always been a safe space for people. Mm. And so a lot of things go on there besides prayer. So if you can tap into the faith community that's a starting point for you. You're going to find probably the leaders in the community are gonna be involved in some of these faith communities. Mm -hmm. You're also gonna find the people of goodwill who are the ones doing this stuff anyway. So you're gonna find the head of the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and the people who are raising money for scholarships. And uh, you're gonna find the people of the community who are the the, um, backbones of the community. You're probably gonna find them there. Uh, there is probably a black newspaper around. Look and see what they've been reporting over time and get a sense of what they've been saying the issues are. The black press dates back to 1827 in the United States and a lot of people, including black students of mine, have never heard of it. But it's very important. Uh, It's been a very important resource over the years. So put in the work to get to know people. When I was out there visiting um, you folks, by the way, we were joking, some, some of my friends and I, that while I was there, I was going to find some black people. And so it became this great joke that I'm gonna find myself some black people. So I posted my first post on Facebook saying I was out there and what I was gonna be doing. And I said, I'm gonna find black people. Well, the first person to respond to my Facebook post turns out to have been one of my cousins who was actually out there with jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra in Wynton Marcellus. And so already that was like 20 black guys right there. I said, okay, you just blew my you know, mission statement here because I already know where you guys are. <laughs> but then we wanted to find a soul food restaurant. So it was the same kind of thing. It became kind of a joke. And then we found this place. I'm not gonna forget his name, the name of it, you guys. Dale, you probably remember the name of the restaurant I'm talking Joe's about. Joe's Cafe? Yes, that. So, so then it became funny to go there and find this soul food place. And uh, so I had a great time doing all of those things. But while I was there, I met people at the cafe who were members of a church in Salt Lake City, I believe, that's been a black congregation that's been there since before Utah was a state. Hmm. So I think tapping into those black folks with those long roots could help you to start offering some context to what black people today may be saying. And that could be done before you get to marching in the streets Mm. kind of thing. 
Very good advice. Thank you. Um, another question, if I can synthesize this correctly, uh, just about your perspective on the depth of racist animosity that seems to find itself in law enforcement. Well, a lot of people have been talking about this topic, and I'm learning uh, some of the history myself. So this is one where I'm still doing some research. I've heard it repeated enough from a variety of sources that I think that the basics of what I'm about to say are true, that the police, uh, policing that we have in this country dates back to uh, policing of slaves. So this comes back to the slave patrols and the kind of thinking that went into protecting white people's property and controlling black bodies has morphed over time into the approach that some police are taking towards black people. They see them as some, some, a group of people who need to be controlled. We say be kept in their place. And sometimes they say it's implicit bias that you pick up along the way. The younger cops are picking it up from the older cops, but it's that mentality that there's something inherently dangerous, criminal, um, deceitful about black folks. And couple that, I suppose, with the increased militarization of police departments, especially after 9-11, then you start seeing all of these ideas colliding and the availability of all the, the big tools, the, the tank trucks and the gear, the riot gear and all that stuff, it makes for it's perfect storm for confrontation between those who are being policed and the police. Um, a lot of the police, it, we discovered in Baltimore, we, the media discovered in Baltimore, um, after the uprising of 2015 here, that a, about a majority, I believe, of the white police do not live in Baltimore. Some live as far away as Pennsylvania and Delaware. Mm. So they have no real contact with and, and connection with the people they are policing. So it's like um, they don't know the good folks, quote unquote, from the troublemakers. Everybody's the same. And if you are as easily frightened as sometimes it appears police are, once they're in these confrontations, their response is, I felt that my life was being threatened. That's always a way to get out of being charged with anything is to say that you felt your life was being threatened. If, if they see everybody as potentially a threat, then we definitely have a problem. And our children don't see police as, you know, people in Baltimore use the term officer friendly. There's always been in various locales, the program to, to connect the police with the elementary school kids kind of thing. Our kids, don't necessarily see that. They're seeing police as, as bad guys or people to run away from or um, people to be fearful of in general. So we've got to sort of find ways to address that. And we haven't come up with anything that's really good yet. They talk about community policing for police officers are supposed to get to know the communities, but that's hit and miss in most places. All right. Um, one of the things from your reading that we, we talked about, but is also a question that's come in, is about the, the presumption that as journalists, we're out to, our, our objective is objectivity. And Wesley Lowry challenged that after his de <laughs> departure from the Washington Post. Do, do you think, besides the research that goes into understanding the background of a story is enough? Or uh, what are your thoughts on his idea that, that trying to achieve objectivity and balance is not the right mark? Well, I've never said that our goal is objectivity, it's fairness. Because okay. by saying objectivity, you're, you're pretending that you yourself can be objective, and we really can't be. We have, we have our own biases, mm -hmm. so if, but if we're committed to fairness, and that's going to lead us to make sure we're covering all the bases that need to be covered. I think the issue is, and it may be particular to the times we're in, again, going back to the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Hmm. 
the we're being bombarded so much with untruths that to just report without acknowledging that somehow is not really serving the readers or the audience, right? So part of this is you can't just say, I'm only gonna report the president said today, when you know that what he just said is a lie or some delusional thing that he came up with overnight. You can't just use the old rules because he's using a different playbook. So I think some of what Wesley Lowry is getting at is related to that. In these times we have, we can't just say, I'm just gonna report and that's it. You guys make up your own minds. Um, that's not serving anybody well. There's a danger though. I, I think uh, Wesley said something about, um, we have to use our moral authority. And that's a danger because who's moral authority and your moral authority may be different from my moral authority and what's moral authority today may be different when we get older. And so that's not useful. Um, but what is useful, I think, is realizing that we have to tell the story in a more complex way that gets away from just the facts, ma'am. Because just the facts, ma'am, is not the truth necessarily. Hmm. So it's up to us, I guess, as individuals to see where we are, but we need to do that in collaboration with whatever our news organization is that we're working with and working through. We have to collectively figure out what is it we're trying to accomplish. And maybe we can serve as checks on each other if you're exercising this moral authority you think you have and you're going a little too far from what's acceptable. It, there is no easy answer, but somewhere in all of that is the process we have to go through to figure out how do we operate in today's times to come closer to telling the truth uh, with, uh, without totally giving in to our own opinions. All right. I'm going to try and synthesize several of the questions that have a similar theme uh, by asking, um, well, sometimes that's harder than, than you think, but uh, when you're talking about objectivity versus fairness, um, we, do, uh, we do have journalists who are stepping outside of their own community. And one of the questions was, is, is it fair to expect, uh, let's say if we're covering a, a protest in Salt Lake City, is it fair to expect the, the black members of that protest to be educating the journalists or does this go back to what you're saying for about being prepared before you get there? Definitely be prepared before you get there. Now, when you talk about being educated by the people on the streets, the, the protesters, uh, well, you, there are different ways to be educated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the person you're talking to could identify to you who is who and who you might want to talk to because that person has a story to tell. So yeah, in that sense, but to get the person on the street that you just happen to be standing next to to explain to you why people are there, no. Because that person will only be telling you his or her perspective. And it may be one that's made up. If some of these marches are susceptible to being infiltrated by the enemy, quote unquote, right? So it could be anybody in, in the march that you happen to stand next to and ask a question of. So do talk to people and ask them to help you to get the lay of the land as to what's going on, but don't accept any one person's version of anything as the gospel truth. You still have work to do. Mm -hmm. You still have to uh, go back and, and, and do some reading. But while you're on the ground, you could be communicating with a newsroom and having someone back in the home office looking up something for you and helping you to figure out what you just thought you saw. So you're not necessarily working in a vacuum here. And in the best of all worlds, you've got a team somewhere helping you to put this together. Okay. Well, uh, we're at the end of our hour, but if we can sum up perhaps with one last question, uh, I'm gonna suggest that that would be, where do we, you talked about some uh, fights that aren't, uh, that aren't conquerable, but that have to be one with each generation. Where do you think we have the potential for the most real change 
what are the kinds of issues that each generation is going to have to take up and, and, and do its own work with? Well, yeah, we want to be optimistic. We always are looking for a way to be optimistic in all this. And I, I think back to that article I, I included in the sources. Um, I wrote this article six years ago for the 60th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And what struck me in researching that whole period was how Black people thought that um, that case held the key to the future. It, and the ruling was the most significant thing since the Emancipation Proclamation. It was, they were thinking of it in those kinds of terms. This was going to be that great turning point. Thurgood and Marshall even predicted that within five years, we would have dismantled segregation. So there's always this tendency to look for that optimistic uh, outcome. I think we have to get away from that. That's the fairy tale part of life. We have to start thinking about the grown up version of life. And so we have to look at not the fact that people are angry right now. We have to get beneath the anger to figure out what are the factors that led them to be here today. And that's going to go back to things that oftentimes people roll their eyes at when you say that behind the crime we're seeing in the community is the broken schools, the lack of health care, kids being you know, exposed to lead is when they're growing up. Um, it's the lack of recreation. We have to deal with those things because ultimately those are the things that matter in creating healthy and hopeful lives. And if everyone is being educated well, then maybe we can use through education an opportunity for black people, white people, Asian people, Latino people, everybody to get to know each other's stories and get to know each other more importantly. So together we can figure out what does it mean in the 21st century to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is my obligation to help my community, however I define my community, achieve that ultimate goal? And I do think each generation has to figure that out and figure out what the tools are for accomplishing that. Thank you. I had one question asking if you would share suggested reading for young journalists. You sent me an email with some additional resources yesterday. Uh, if you want to have add any suggestions to that, I'd be happy to distribute them among the group, including the movies you watch that um, you might otherwise have to pay for, but some of the streaming services are offering for free now, right now that you would recommend as offering some good perspective and commentary on um, the topics we've been talking about. So yeah. I think if there's anything else you want to add to that list, and then I'll distribute it to the group. Yeah, I may have a couple of things, but not much more because I, you want to make it manageable. Okay. But definitely all of you, I recommend to everybody take advantage of all those free streaming movies right now. Um, and they will be an eye opener. And hopefully if you, if you approach movies and uh, television shows the way I do, you're jotting down things and you may be going to Wikipedia to look something up because you want to know more. And I think some of the things on my list may trigger that. And it's in that process that you'll begin to educate yourself. It's not a bad idea to watch with somebody else or to have a reading group or something and, and to bounce ideas off of each other. I think the more we share our, what we think we know and share our questions about what we don't know, the better off we are when it comes to educating ourselves about all of this.